As always in FIFA Windows, when you have nine days, you, you have a lead into the first game. We have a few more days, even if that's not much as well. We have three training sessions, but then it's a challenge to download that first game and then upload the second game. So we do recovery yesterday to physically and mentally download the, the Spain game, which everyone understands it was a, was a tough one. And then we have one day now to, to prepare for, for the Portugal game and one training session and play against a team that plays very, very different than Spain. And that means you need to do a little bit more in the video room, a little bit more in individual meeting. So it's been a lot of preparation to get the team physically ready for it, mentally ready for it, and then today a lot tactically ready for it. Can you please use the raise your hand function if you would like to ask a question? We'll kick it off with Ben. Uh, yeah, good morning, Tony. I guess the obvious one is how is the team's confidence and uh, your confidence as well after such a, a big loss to Spain? I... I actually think, uh, don't take this wrong, it sounds strange maybe when I say it, but we looked at the Spain game as two games, as I said afterwards, um, which we had prepped in advance. And the fact that we managed with, in that first half, um, just to put a little bit in perspective, when we played New Zealand, we had almost 1,000 caps uh, starting. Against uh, Spain, we had less than 500. Uh, against New Zealand, the player with the, the least amount of caps had 25. Against Spain, we had five players with less than 10. I think going into that game, it was a, a bit uncertainty. What can we actually do against Spain with this team? And the fact that we came off that first half feeling that we could compete with them, with that team, actually gave them confidence because it was an uncertainty how we could actually compete. Uh, maybe the floodgates would have opened up already in the first half like it did in the second, but it didn't. That first half was actually a solid performance. Very different from what I normally do. I know some people would say, why didn't you press them higher and go with your aggressive team, uh, you know, aggressive type of playing. We need to be humble enough to understand when we play Spain with that team, we need to adjust. Second half, I think that's a wake up call for a lot of people. Um, I am not too surprised, to be honest, and that is not to criticize the players on the park, but if you have four players playing MPL and one player playing college and you play Spain, uh, you know that you most likely are going to lose and it's a question of how many goals. But we can't shy away from that and let that get to our confidence. It's just an answer telling on where we are right now with those players and that pathway. And it's more looking at that as, okay, that's an insight that tells us where we're at and we need to keep investing to be fair to these players, to have a fair chance to jump from club land to international football, which is right now too big of a step for them. So in that sense, when you ask, do we have confidence? Yes, we do, but we also have an understanding of where we are with that playing group compared to top international football. Aaron. Morning or afternoon over there. I just want to check how everyone has pulled up after the game. I know Tegan Micah had is it an ankle injury. Uh, I don't want to go into details on who's available or not, but uh, Tegan is fine. She trained fully today, uh, so did all the three goalkeepers. Uh, we have a couple of question marks for tomorrow's game. Um, but like I said, right now, I don't want it to respect the players here. And, and also, I want to get updates from the SSSM team, meaning sports medicine and sports science, tomorrow morning. But we might be um, forced to make a couple of changes in, in the lineup tomorrow based on player availability. But I will know more in the morning. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Tony, uh, we know we, we have an understrength team there, but uh, I think a lot of people have been taken aback by losing 7-0. Uh, regardless of who's there, it's an Australian team. Uh, do you understand why some people are now wondering, well, what's the purpose of this game and where are we going with this? Uh, I don't. Uh, first of all, it surprised me that people are surprised. Because um, if you follow the, the women's game for a long time now and see where Spain at and see what they've done the last two years with the senior national team and also the success they had with the new, youth national team before that winning tournaments, you look at their scores against teams like Scotland or whatever it might be and you look at the score lines of what they've done and then you look at what kind of team we are bringing. Uh, I'm actually surprised that people are surprised because um, that is where we are. Uh, and we need to be okay to see the truth in the eye here and identify that and then keep investing and keep believing um, and keep wanting to improve. Um, the second part of that question, I think, is, is why is people wondering why we actually play with an understrength team? Uh, I say what I said before. 
I, as a coach, always want the best team possible when we play the best teams. And that's what was the intention when we scheduled this game way back, because th there's a lot of planning behind in, in scheduling, and especially to get a top team in Europe is not easy. And it was very, very few windows in this year where we could get a top team like Spain. And we knew the European, the windows before European Championship was one of the only windows we can get top quality opponents in Europe. And we really wanted to have that to play a tough schedule. When we realized that we needed to change, um, I could go a little bit egoistic to protect myself from screwing in media or fans or whatever to say, I need the best team no matter what. I'm not going to listen to well-being. I'm not going to listen to individual adjustment. I need the best team so that we don't lose big and we get criticized. Or I can say, you know what? We need to change the approach to this camp. We need to protect and have a player-centric approach and look at the long term what's best for the World Cup and then change perspective of this camp to say, okay, we're playing one of the best teams in the world with an understrength team, how can we get benefits from that? And one is to get an understanding from internally and externally where we're at with the depth of a roster um, in the Matildas as of now. But the other one is to encourage these players that now have experienced this to know what it's like. I had a meeting tonight when I gathered the whole playing group together and say, this is not criticizing you. This is perfect for you to get this experience, to know what it's like, know what it takes, and now challenge yourself to do everything you can to be ready for this level next time you're called into the Matildas. Whether that's individual training, whether it's an individual program, whether it's trying to find an environment that is tougher so that they get challenged every, uh, every day, and whether it's playing more games. One of the gap reports that came out that the Federation have released is that our players are not playing enough games throughout 12 months period a year, and we need to find solutions to that. A follow up question, Benz? Uh, yeah, Tony, so you're not worried that some of the young players who were kind of thrown into this game and, and had a heavy loss, are they not going to be scarred by it a little bit? And, and also, I mean, do you think the big losses like that, are they tarnishing them until there's reputation a bit? But, you know, we want them to be obviously a, a feared team around the world. First part of that, I, I hope I can't answer for all the individuals. Uh, obviously, there's always tough to lose. These are competitors. These are players that hate to lose. Um, but the environment we have tried to create in here is a very safe environment where it's sometimes okay to fail as long as you take those experience and want to get better. And I think a couple of those players, uh, whether it was a debutant or playing with, with less caps that got the experience, are saying, Ah, okay, thank you for giving me that experience. Now I understand. I thought I understood, but now I really understand what it's about. And they can now go back and, and work on it. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of an example on that one. Sorry if it's a long answer, but Jamila Rankin came in to us in uh, September in a camp. And afterwards, her words was, whoa, uh, this, this was a wake-up call, like training in the mid till environment. I had an idea, but it was not even close. Like this is, oh, wow. I, I need to go back and work. Then she goes almost for a year and work on things and she comes into the environment now. And one of the reasons why I gave her those first minutes against Spain is that she came in much more ready, not ready, but much more ready. She was closer this time when she came in than the first time. And I think it's going to be the same for some other people that experienced the Matillas for the first time now that, ah, okay, this is what it's like. I can go back home and work on it. The challenge with this is, the Matildas is not a development platform. A senior national team should not work on development players at the same time as trying to win games. A senior Matilda should be at the tip of the iceberg and everything that happened underneath in club land and other areas of the development pathways should make them ready for international football. And that's where we need to invest. That's where the spotlight and the focus uh, needs to be. When it comes to reputation, all I can say is I understand that my name as a head coach now, the reputation is probably going to, you know, I'm going to get scrutinized, criticized. The Matildas might be it. We've been there before. We know what it's like when we lost all those friendlies in April against Germany and Netherlands and going into the Olympics and such. But I also think sometimes a reality check, even if it hurts, can be healthy for the long term. Short term, it hurts for all of us, including us in and around the Matildas, fans, media, stakeholders, federation, players, staff. But in the long run, maybe that's exactly what we need um, to realize exactly where we're at and what we need to do. 
consists of different between expectations and belief. I will never ever stop believing in this team, but we also need to be fair on what we can expect and at what time we can expect it. Aaron. I'm just following on, you mentioned that obviously Portugal are a different team to Spain. What, what will you change in terms of tactics? Can we expect a different looking setup on the field? Yes, uh, great question. Um, first of all, always when we're going to an opponent, we try to look at uh, past experience against that opponent. Spain was obviously a new one, so we didn't have any past experience to go back to. Portugal we do, so we went back to 2018 in Algarve Cup when we played Portugal twice, a tie and a loss, um, and with a much more experienced team on the park those games than we have now. So we need to be humble enough to understand that this is also going to be a tough game. So we don't fall into that trap that, okay, now we play Spain, one of the world's best team, and now we play Portugal, a less strong team. No, this is going to be a tough challenge. And me as a coach and the players need to be humble to understand that we need to be really, really prepared to play this team. Um, but secondly, they play very different than Spain, different formation, different priorities. Um, but there's also a team that is peaking for, for the Euros. Um, and we might, you might see a, a different formation from us. Uh, you might see some tactical flexibility in that that we worked on, but it's a little bit based on player availability and I know more about that in, in the morning. Follow-up question, Erin? Yeah, just one last one for me. Obviously, Ellie Carpenter with the World Cup coming, she's in a bit of a race against the clock. Are you trying to have a backup handy? I mean, she's not an easy player to replace. Yeah, I think, first of all, I feel with Ellie, but if it's someone that should make it back, it's actually her. She's so professional and mature for her age, and, and she's already starting her rehab process. Um, in parallel with that, that we're going to do everything we can to support her and Leon in her journey to get back, we need to look at uh, replacements. But I also want to be clear here, we, we can't find a replacement that we think is going to be a new Ellie, because Ellie is Ellie, so whoever plays there need to have a fair chance to play as an outside back or a wing back the way they play it. We have a few options now. We can either go back to what we did in the Olympics and go back to play a back three, when we have three backs available and kind of take one back out of the equation and play more with wing backs, because we have a lot of attacking midfielders and forwards that can play wing backs, similar to the Olympics with Meeks and Russell, for example. Another option is that we'll look at natural replacements that have played outside backs and do it in club lang, like a Charlotte Grant, for example, that done it. Uh, we also have looked at, as you've seen, Courtney Vine. We're already back in Asian Cup. We used that as a right back a little bit because we have so many forwards and attacking midfielders. We can also take plays from those positions down in those outside back positions. Um, and we need to use this time from now up until the World Cup to look at what are the different backup options that we have. And you'll see that we'll look at one solution tomorrow, maybe two, and, and then we're gonna keep looking at that moving forward. Thanks very much, Aaron. Do you have a final question, Bez? I, I do, I can ask one, Tony, if, if you don't mind. Um, if you have a tough loss like that, do you do a debrief with the FA? I know, I know you talked about you have some key performance indicators in your contract and that sort of stuff. Do you talk to James Johnson or, or someone in the setup and and talk about what went wrong? Well, there's always a conversation going on. When you're in camp, it's extremely busy. But what we do after each camp is review internally, meaning we have the Triple SM department reviewing, the ops department, the technical department. We review as a staff. We review with the leadership group, with the players. We review together with Paddy, our high performance manager. We review with the FA. Um, I'd say the balancing in that question when you say, do you talk about what went wrong? I would like to twist that question the way we ask it is, what did we learn? Um, that's how I look at it. Because um, when you say what went wrong, it sounds like the result is a reflection that we failed, meaning the expectation was that we should have done something better. Um, and I think I look at that a little bit different, um, but we always discuss what did we learn for sure.